All right. Hi, everybody. My name is William Smith, and I'm a professional services engineer with JAMF. Let's talk again about administering Office 2016 for Mac. This was going to be a two-part presentation. Uh, Vivek Kumar, who is with Microsoft, was going to join me to speak about changes to uh, and improvements to Outlook. But unfortunately, he tore his meniscus just a couple of weeks ago and just went, underwent surgery, so he's not able to be with us this week. Uh, get well, Vivek. Instead, I'll be using our time to talk about Microsoft Auto Update and managing updates. Before we get started, let's get an update on events. A couple years ago, I began my presentation with the brief history of Office for Mac, and I continued that history to last year's Penn State uh, conference. Since last year, we've seen Office transition from 32-bit to 64-bit, and we've seen a few releases of Microsoft Auto Update that include features such as not having to be an administrator to install updates, and silent updates that run in the background. We've seen lots of feedback from administrators to Microsoft get incorporated into the product, such as the ability to create configuration profiles that allow us to disable the What's New Windows suite wide or completely turn off macros suite wide. We've seen the Outlook team introduce their Insights blog on MSDN. That's giving us a heads up about what's new in, in, in Insider Fast and when to expect new features to release to production. We now have the ability to save Microsoft error reporting crash reports for troubleshooting. And today, we have nearly 20 Microsoft developers and product managers from across the Office for Mac uh, teams joining us on Slack. Looking forward, there's one date everyone needs to know about. In just a few months, support for Office for Mac 2011, along with Link for Mac, comes to an end. Microsoft actually extended support from the original date of January 2016 for another one and a half years until this October. We shouldn't be surprised by this. This lifecycle policy was published more than five years ago. Aside from that, October is also going to coincide very closely with the release of Mac OS 1013 High Sierra. So will Office 2011 for Mac run on High Sierra? Microsoft published this comment the first day of Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference this year. Office 2011 has not been tested on High Sierra, and they have no plans to support it. If you haven't already made the plans to migrate users to Office 2016, you should do so before October if you want to stay supported. Your only options for support after October are going to be peer-to-peer -peer support groups like Mac Admin Slack or forums or mailing lists. We're at the end of Office 2011 after, after seven years. All right, let's get started talking about Microsoft Auto Update, which I'll refer to as MAL going forward. Uh, no one update workflow is ideal for everyone. Workflows requiring less administration also provide less control. Likewise, workflows requiring more administration are going to give you more control. You decide what works best for your environment. We're going to cover the three pieces of every workflow, the trigger, the delivery mechanism, and version control. Then we're going to look at combining these pieces to help you decide which workflow works best for you. By default, MAO installs with the automatically check setting enabled. This is the behavior we've seen for the past several years. Yes, it's automatic, but it's also kind of intrusive to the user. When MAO detects updates are available, the application launches and then prompts the end user to install them. That's great. Uh, well, great for consumers, but maybe too intrusive for an organization with lots of installations. Administrators do have a couple of options they can set for the end users. Uh, by default, the daemon checks for updates every 12 hours. Uh, that's modifiable. Uh, maybe we want to be aggressive and change that to 
every four hours instead of every 12 hours. Or maybe we want to be less aggressive and just change that to once a week to check. That means once a week for this pop-up to come up if there's something available. We can either use a plist uploaded to a custom configuration profile or a shell command to modify a plist on the Mac to change the update check frequency key from the default 720 minutes, which is every 12 hours, to something like 240 minutes, which is every four hours. Or maybe you want to change it to 10,080 uh, 10, minutes, which is every seven days. Now here, I'm listing both the plist for a configuration profile as well as the defaults write command. You can run this in terminal or as part of a script. And all of these slides will be available, so you can either take pictures now or you can wait till the slides come out, and you'll have everything that I'm, getting, that I'm showing you here. Also, we can change Mal from checking and prompting the user to checking and installing silently. Again, we can either use a plist uploaded to a custom configuration profile or a shell script to change the how to check key from automatic to automatic download. I highly recommend using a configuration profile to set both of these options instead of the shell command because profiles will enforce these settings. But if you prefer simply to default your users to these settings and then let them change them after the fact, then use the shell command instead. Now, we're also beginning to identify some of those pieces we can use in our update workflows. The simplest trigger we have is the user. Mal may automatically check for updates and notify that they're available, but it's the user that him or herself must trigger the update process to start. But where does Mal get these software, uh, the software updates from? By default, it connects to Microsoft's Content Delivery Network, or CDN, and it pulls the update over the internet. And of course, Microsoft is authoritative for telling Mal which new version is available. It stores that information on its CDNs too. Another way to prevent disruptions to your users is to simply turn off automatic updates in Mal by selecting manually check. This doesn't prevent the end user from choosing help, check for updates, and uh, in, in any Office application and, uh, and running Mal directly. Uh, and installing those updates. It simply takes the automatic out of the workflow. Now, administrators with custom settings configuration profiles can enforce this option. Managing any of these options dims their appearance and prevents the end user from choosing anything else. In this case, our configuration profile, or our shell command, sets the how to check key to manual. So, why would we ever want to set this to manual to prevent Mal from checking for software updates? Anyone? Yes. Exactly. Exactly. One reason is that you want to control both the version and the timing of the updates, and you want to use your tool to do it. So while we can control the frequency of when Mal checks, again, every 12 hours by default, we can't whitelist or blacklist specific days or coordinate all Macs to update at a specific time. That's where we have to have a third-party tool help us out. Also, Mal reaches out to Microsoft and downloads the latest version of Office and installs that. By default, we can't control what version it's going to get. To get that control, administrators must bypass Mal and download a specific Office update and then deploy it using a third-party tool like Apple Remote Desktop or Jamf or Monkey. This gives us some more to add to our matrix of options for building workflows now. If Mal is set to manual, then we as admins must trigger the install for the updates. We won't use Mal, but we'll use our own third-party management tool. This not only gives us the ability to use our own server for distribution and our own deployment uh, tool for, to control the specific version, it lets us also say when it will happen. We're making a very heavy investment in our own infrastructure, but we're gaining more control. 
But there's one more trigger coming soon. And it's coming in Microsoft Auto Update 4.0. And we're going to get command line support, which we can use for scripting and remote commands. So by now, I think I know what you're going to say. Weren't we already supposed to have MAL 4 by now? And the answer is yes, we were. Our Microsoft friend in the uh, Microsoft Office channel on Slack, Paul Bowden, let me know about a month ago that it simply wasn't going to be ready for the conference this year. We were really hoping we could show this to you and you'd be able to download it, get it sometime around the conference. But even Microsoft can run short of developer resources and that's why we just simply don't see it yet. You may have noticed his post in the Jobs Board channel on Slack back in early May. If you're interested in a career change from administration to development and have programming experience and uh, good personal hygiene, I'm glad to introduce you both. Although we may not have MAL 4.0 in production today, Paul did give me an early copy so that I could demonstrate some of those features for you here. So I'm going to break out. What I have on my machine right here is just a virtual machine, and this virtual machine is running MAL 4.0. What I wanted to point out to you, though, is that I'm not logged in. I want, to, I want you to understand that when I connect to this, it's going to be through terminal, and there is nothing that's happening at the login window. So first thing I need to do, let's find out what my IP address is as of this room. And we're going to SSH into that. Can you guys see that OK? Do I need to blow it up a little bit more? Let's try that. So I'm going to SSH into my virtual machine. And sure. All right. I'm in. And just to show you that Office is installed, I'm going to look for all the Microsoft applications in the Applications folder, and there they are. We've got Excel, we've got OneNote, PowerPoint, the entire suite. All right, let's get rid of that. Now, Mal lives in Library, Application Support, Microsoft, in a folder called MAU 2.0. Why they still call it 2.0, I have no idea. We're getting ready to hit four. Uh, the tool is called Microsoft Auto Update. Inside that is the MAU application, or the MAU command line tool. So we have to go a little bit further. We're going to go to Contents. We're going to go to Mac OS. And you'll see that we have MAU. That's our command line tool right there. Now, if I just hit return without adding any kind of parameters to it, it gives us the ability to see what it can do. So this is kind of like our help page. You may notice, uh, let's see if I can highlight it here, we have the ability to list updates that are available. We have the ability to actually say update. Uh, we have the ability to register, and I skipped one here. We have the ability to get the current status of mail as it is right now. So let's start off with that. If I go to mail and I say status, there we go. It's uh, telling me that uh, it's never checked for updates before. Uh, we are going to the production channel and we have these apps registered with mail. Now, if none of these apps were showing up here, I would actually be able to say register these apps. How many folks have had this problem where they install Office for a user and then it ends up not registering the apps and they don't, the, our end users don't end up seeing the uh, apps show up as, in the updates? That's because the apps are not registered with MAL. The MAL tool is going to give us the ability to do that through a script. All right, so let's see what else we've got here. Instead of status, I can say list. What updates are available right now? And ignore some of this, it's still kind of uh, in development. But right now, I have 15.33 15 installed on my machine. And we've got 15.36 as of this week. 
just went into production on Wednesday, actually a little bit earlier, I think Tuesday. Uh, that's it. If I wanted to, I could actually replace list with update. However, eh, not going to work. This is why we need developers, folks. Again, if you're interested in a career in development and would like to go to work for Microsoft and you have good personal hygiene, <laughs> you can help us get this fixed. <laughs> but keep in mind, you are going to have the ability to register those apps to see what's available. You'll find out the version of Mal that you've got installed. Uh, almost everything that we would need in order to be able to manage our updates through command line. Finally, hopefully in just a couple of months, we'll find out before long, I hope. All right. Any questions about that, about the command line tool? OK. So getting back here. Third party management of Mal becomes a third trigger in our matrix with the addition of command line support. This is going to give us a lot of flexibility for controlling when we apply updates and how we start them. So let's finish out the second column of our matrix where we get our up where do we get our updates? By default, our Mac clients use Mal to pull updates directly from Microsoft CDN. And when uh, and when we decide to disable Mal from checking for updates and instead push our own updates using a third party management tool, those updates come from some sort of distribution server that the management tool controls. But we have one more tool that can serve as a source of updates, and that's a caching server. Malcache Admin is akin to an Apple or a Windows software update server for Office updates. It sits inside your network and periodically checks the exact same Microsoft CDN that Mal checks. It'll download those packages and those updates and cache them for you to host internally for your clients. It's only getting Mac Office updates. It's not for Windows Office updates, but a version of it does run on Windows in the form of a PowerShell script, as well as most any Unix or Mac flavor in the form of a Bash script. A local caching server requires that your clients run Mal 3.8 or later. Today, we're about 3.9. So if you're up to date with your Office updates, you're already there. Not only does it download and cache updates for each, uh, each Office application, it also downloads and caches updates for Mal, Link, Skype for Mac for business, and the full suite deltas for both Office 2011 and Office 2016. One thing to note about the Office 2016 deltas is that they're getting smaller and smaller. When Microsoft first started releasing updates for Office 2016, the updates per app and, uh, were, were per app, and they were a few to several hundred megabytes each. Updating each app individually was larger than deploying the entire full suite installer. However, starting around version 15.34, again, we're at 15.36 today, so just a couple of months ago, Microsoft has been testing full suite Delta updates, and these rival the 100 megabyte updates that we had with Office 2011. Now, don't take these numbers as gospel yet. There's, we're still testing. Uh, these are very early testing numbers, but Mal is smart enough to get the most efficient download available. If you look at this table, and uh, you can see that the current version of Office, which is 15.33 on my machine, and if the next version available is 15, whoop, one back. If the next uh, available update is 15.34, then it only needs to get a delta update. The size of that update is only 67 megs for the entire suite. And that's smaller than any of the Office 2011 delta updates ever were. I'll point out, though, that the Suite Delta updates are on hold for a while until Microsoft uh, works out some issues that they found in their testing. So the numbers I just showed you aren't what you see today. We're still getting individual apps uh, right now for the updates. The size of each of those app updates, though, ranges from 45 to 150 meg 
or just under 700 meg for the full suite update. That's still half the size of deploying a full installer as an update. If you saw my administering Office 2016 for Mac Part Do presentation last year, uh, you may recall I was advocating deploying the full suite installer as an update for, all, for f whenever you have three or more apps. So Microsoft has really been optimizing their delivery with Mal. So bottom line, Mal generates the least amount of network traffic of any update mechanism. If internet bandwidth is a concern, or if you need to reduce traffic on your internal network, or if you want the, latest, the, the fastest update method available, consider using Mal. Now let's get back to Malcache Admin. I kind of went off on a, on a tangent here for a little bit. Let's assume that I'm going to run Malcache Admin on my Mac. I have to do a few things. I have to do five things in order to put it into production. So after downloading the script from GitHub, uh, you'll need to put it on a web server with about 10 gigs or so of available space if you only want to serve Mal, Office 2016, Office 2011, Link, and Skype updates. Or about 25 gig if you also want to host Insider updates. You can download Apple server app for 20 bucks or if you have an internal jam for monkey system, you already have a web server. I'm from Jamf, so I'm going to show you how to use a Jamf server to serve updates. I don't advocate doing this for production, but for testing, this is super easy to set up. And if you have a test server, test there. So this is using the Jamf server, but not necessarily using Jamf to install. By default, your JSS files are, are located in library JSS. Web pages are served from Tomcat's root folder. You can create a new folder here called something like Malcache or anything that you would like. Uh, don't use any special characters or spaces. Keep this very simple. I suggest you just stick with letters or numbers. That's it. That's all you have to do in order to set that up. Next, we need to warm the cache. That's a fancy way of saying we're going to download everything that's available right now to get the server ready to serve Office updates. So I'm going to download the Malcache admin tool and place it in my user's shared folder. Then I'll open up terminal. I'll run the cd command to change directory into the user's shared folder. And I'll run the Malcache admin tool without any parameters. This brings up the usage page for the tool. There's only one parameter that Malcache admin requires, and that's the cache path. In our case, that's going to be the Malcache folder that we created in the JSS Tomcat folder. Everything else in square brackets is optional. And you can string several of these parameters together. So we can, only, uh, we can optionally add the check interval parameter along with the number of minutes, such as 240 for every two, uh, four hours. Uh, you only need to do this if you're actually running the script through terminal and you're not using it with a timer, such as cron or launch D or uh, the Windows scheduling service. If you don't really care to take the time to download the production packages to your caching server, but you just want an updated list of what's available, Add the show, oh, sorry. Add the show collateral parameter. It'll return a list like this of available updates. And what's very cool is Malcache Admin supports downloading and caching insider builds. So we can run the Malcache Admin tool with only the required dash dash cache path in the path to Malcache folder and we can see a variety, uh, a very detailed output of what's happening here. It queries Microsoft for a list of packages, verifies whether the package is already downloaded and skips it if it is. Otherwise, it returns the package name, the size, its download URL. As it proceeds with the download, it provides a progress indicator at the bottom. 
It proceeds, uh, proceeds to do this for the next update and every update after that that's available on the Microsoft CDN. For my testing at home, it took about 11 minutes to download six gigs of files. Nobody can pair your internet with mine, it's terrible. You'll notice that for every Office 2016 application, it downloads three packages. The largest in this case is for Outlook 15.35. It's a full application installer for those machines that are more than three versions behind. It's about 800 meg. The other two, though, they're much smaller. They're Delta updates for machines that are only behind one or two versions. So the smaller Delta update for updating from 1534 to 1535 is only 175 meg. Altogether, Mal downloaded 21 packages and folders in order to keep me up to date. Now, when I included the Insider builds, it downloaded a total of 108 packages and folders. For Outlook alone, that's another 18 packages, which, uh, most of which are deltas, updating a very specific version to another very specific version. So the total of all those production updates, plus the Insider slow, plus the Insider fast updates, was about 23 gigs. All right. We've downloaded Malcache Admin onto a web server. We've created the spot for our cache files, and we've warmed the cache. The next thing to do is to keep that cache updated. On a Mac, that's pretty simple using a LaunchD daemon. Again, I'm running mine on a Mac, so I'm going to show you what we do here. LaunchD is Apple's tool for triggering a process on a periodic basis, something, uh, like when something happens, or a user logs in, or a drive mounts to the desktop. You can create your launch daemon by hand using a text editor. Uh, Apple has a whole section on its developer site just for LaunchD, but I like using Peter Borg's uh, LingenX, or Lingen 10 tool, uh, which is about $10. And I use it to make my LaunchD agents and my daemons. Uh, if you use this tool, be sure to get the download from Peter's website and not the Mac App Store version. The App Store version can't make launch daemons uh, due to Apple sandboxing restrictions. These are the settings that I used for my daemon. It'll run as root. I gave it the name com.talkingmoose.malcacheadmin. It'll run the malcache admin script that's in the user's shared folder followed by the cache path argument, and it'll run whenever the computer starts up, as well as every four hours. Because I'm running this as root, Lingen saves it in the library launch daemons folder and starts the first trigger as soon as I save. So this is the plist that Lingen created in the launch daemons folder. I'm putting it here in case you want to reference the, side, uh, the slides later. Finally, we need to take care of the last step, which is to point our Macs to our caching server. Just to reiterate what I said, this requires MAL 3.8 or later on your client machines. The easiest way to point Macs to a caching server is to use a configuration profile. The simplest way to start is to create a plist using the default uh, command and terminal. The command I'm about to show you is just really one line, but I'm going to break it up for you. You'll see I've added some backslashes at the ends of each of these lines to indicate that the command continues to the next line. So in terminal, I'll start with defaults right. I'm going to create the com.microsoft.autoupdate2 plist file on my desktop. That makes it uh, easy to find, uh, easier to find my plist, and I'm not actually modifying my computer settings to do this. The key I'm creating in the plist file is named update cache and its value is a string that denotes the URL of my caching server, my JSS caching server. If anybody's hosting internally, you have to add the 8443. Uh, by the way, be sure to include that trailing slash at the end of the caching server address. Depending on your management system, you may need to use the plutil command to convert the plist you just created on your desktop from binary to plain text XML. So I've added this uh, one extra command for you just in case. And then just for your reference, if you're looking at the slides later, 
this is what the content of that new plist file on your desktop looks like. Now, if your management system doesn't support creating uh, and deploying configuration profiles, you can use Tim, Sut uh, Tim Sutton's excellent MCX to profile tool. Uh, just run the MCX profile command against the plist, and it'll create a mobile config profile for you. All you need to do is just double click the file and follow the prompts to install it in system preferences. If you're using a management tool like Jamf or Apple's Profile Manager, create a new confi uh, custom configuration profile with the custom settings payload, upload your plist, and save. Push this profile to your Macs, and you're done. Now, how do I know my Macs are actually talking to my caching server? How do I know it's working? Another new feature of Microsoft Auto Update 3.8 and higher is logging. You'll find the Auto Update log in the top level library folder. And if you manually run Auto Update and start a download, you'll see a line like this that indicates where the package is coming from. In my example here, it's coming from my Jamf server, not coming from Microsoft. One important thing to note is that if you set the update cache key using a configuration profile or you edit the com.microsoft.autoupdate2 plist file, that address is enforced. In my testing, Mao did not fall back to Microsoft CDN if it couldn't connect to my server. That's a bug, and Microsoft's going to address that in the future. The expected behavior is if Mao cannot connect to the server you have chosen, it will default back to Microsoft. That's the last of our sources for getting updates. That's just one last cell to fill in. In addition to what starts an update and where it comes from, we need to know how to, uh, we can manage the version of Office that gets installed. I worked for a company that produced documents that were submitted for SEC filings. Every year from January to April, I had to freeze our production systems on a standard set of software that, that we would thoroughly vetted. Uh, because of tight deadlines, we couldn't risk a Mac uh, having different versions of fonts, different versions of software that might cause a several hundred page document to, to reflow. Uh, the editors and the proofreaders could open these documents on any of 120 various Macs across the world. And that's during dozens of production cycles. Managing software versions was crucial. This is where a manifest server comes into play. When Mal checks for updates, it connects to a manifest server on the internet and gets a list of available updates in a, uh, listed in an XML file there. It compares the list of updates against the app versions installed on the machine, and if it notes that the XML uh, references newer versions, it reports updates are available. Here's what Mao's going to find on the manifest server, just a list of files. Each Office 2016 application has a unique identifier that never changes, and every update has two similarly named files that are collectively called collateral. In a nutshell, the XML file in the collateral contains the latest version available and the URLs to download those updates. Remember, Mal will choose one of two Delta updates uh, for fairly up-to-date systems or a full updater. If the current software is three versions behind, it's going to use that full updater. The .cat file, with the same name as the XML file, is a security catalog. It's a Microsoft signed file used to verify both the XML and the packages haven't been tampered with or modified. So you can use these cat files. You cannot modify them for your own use. All right. We can get collateral files from two places. If any of you have ever visited Paul Bowden's macadmins.software page, you may have noticed this column at the very end of the list of updates. He keeps a running history of those collateral files here. With this page, you can download most any specific version of Office and its collateral. If necessary, um, you'll need to update Mal to 3.8 or later, and then you can point it to a server on your network hosting the collateral files and prevent Office from updating any further. 
it'll simply assume that the collateral uh, files that it finds reference the latest versions of software, and it won't go any further. Or you might have noticed uh, this folder when I was talking about malcache admin a little bit earlier. And maybe you notice these additional parameters. You can specify malcache admin not download packages using the no packages parameter, but instead just download the collateral by itself. You might opt to let mal get its updates directly from Microsoft, but direct it to your manifest server to specify which versions of software it'll get. Or maybe you'll want to host both the cached updates as well as the manifest servers to be even more flexible. Setting up your, ma uh, your manifest server is very similar to setting up your caching server. You'll download the collateral from either the macadmins.software site or using malcache admin, and you'll place it on a web server. This can be the same Jamf or Monkey server in the same folder if you would like. The uh, collateral files will need about 5 to 10 megs of space. They're not very big. If you're running malcache admin, you'll receive the collateral files automatically in a collateral folder. I suggest you create a production folder inside that um, and move the collateral files that you want, in other words, the versions that you want to keep, into that production folder, and uh, we'll point our Macs there. So similar to pointing your Macs to your caching server, You'll need to point them to the collateral folder on the manifest server. In terminal, I'll start with defaults right. I'll create the com.microsoft.autoupdate2 plist on my desktop. Again, because it's just easier to find that I'm not modifying my computer settings. I need to run two commands. The first key I'm creating in the plist files is named channel name, and its value is simply custom. The second key I'm creating in this plist file is named manifest server, and its value is the path to my production server all the way to that production server, or that production folder, I should say. Again, don't forget the trailing slash at the end of this URL. Depending on your management system, you may need to use the plutil command to convert the plist just created on your desktop from binary to plain text XML. I'm including the final plist here for your reference later. Follow the same steps that I outlined earlier about using MCX to profile to convert the plist uh, to a configuration profile or upload the plist to your custom settings payload in a management server. And you've now effectively redirected your clients to your manifest server. All right. And that completes our matrix. We have three methods for triggering the update process to start, three options for sourcing our files, and three ways to control the software version. Let's see how we can put these together. Three times three times three. That equals 27 potential workflows. In reality, though, we have a handful of items that aren't going to mix, so we have a little bit less than 27, but we still have plenty that we can build. So here's what we're going to do now. We'll pick one from each of the columns, and we're going to combine them to create a workflow. Then we'll talk about the benefits and the drawbacks of that workflow. The simplest workflow is straight across the top. Just let your users and Microsoft take care of everything. You do nothing after you install the software. The Office installer includes the MAL, and it's automatically configured to alert your end users when updates are available. They can choose to install the updates right away, or they can simply cancel. If they cancel, then MAL will remind them again in 12 hours. For the most part, I like this workflow because it's very hands-off for me, the administrator. If I don't care what version of Office 2016 they're running, then I don't need to manage a thing. And I don't need to worry about my end users installing their own updates because as of now, 3.6, it no longer requires admin privileges to complete the updates. But I'm also giving up any modicum of management and control. Some users may never update, and some may be sporadic about their updates. So how about this? Instead of letting the user decide that he or she is going to update, I force the updates. 
I still allow Microsoft to host the packages on their CDN, and I let them decide the current version. Uh, but I push a single configuration profile that sets Mal to automatically download and install. This takes the control out of the user's hands. Notice the configuration profile that I've applied dims the options and makes them inaccessible. I still don't get to say when, but at least I get to say keep up with what's current. For your reference later, here's the plist to create that configuration profile as well as the terminal command to do the same thing. Finally, I can opt to maintain a complete control over the timing by setting the how to check key in that plist to manual, and then using my management tool to schedule the Mal, uh, when Mal should run. This takes advantage of Mal 4.0's new scripting capabilities. For this, I'd apply a configuration profile to set Mal to only allow a manual check. If the user wants to check for updates, that's OK. Uh, but with this setting, there's no interruption to the user on my behalf. Then I'd add a script to my management system to run the Mal command line tool when I say to run. Here's the plist to create that configuration profile, as well as the terminal command to set this for a user. Here's the mal4 command I'd send to my device to initiate the updates. Remember, all three of these workflows rely on Microsoft hosting the update and controlling the update versions. We're only changing the trigger that starts the updates. Now, here's another scenario. Look at the trigger. Look at the source of the updates and what's controlling the version of the updates. I can think of at least two software management systems that support this workflow. Can anybody name them? So the user initiates the update, but I control where the updates are coming from. Jamf, yes. You've got it. Jamf self-service is one. Let's not forget about Monkey's Managed Software Center is another one. So. Both of these management systems have a self-help application that a user can run to do something like install an, up, or, uh, an update package. The package has to already be downloaded and added to the management system's uh, distribution server, which means the deployment tool controls the version of the update. Now, how about this scenario? It's very common. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, uh, it's very common. Uh, in this case, I would set Mao to manually check for updates, or maybe Mao completely is blocked at the network level. That means my management tool for choice entirely controls the update uh, trigger, and the updates happen automatically. As an admin, I have to programmatically or manually take those Office updates and get them into my system. At no point, though, is Microsoft technology ever being used in this workflow. So the first one with admin was, uh, with user was self-help. The other, right now, is saying I'll control everything from end to end using my management server. So here we have the control going back to the user to initiate the update. More than likely, Mal's prompting the user that updates are available. In this case, though, I'm using Malcache Admin to host the updates while still allowing Microsoft to control the version. This is a perfect example of using Malcache Admin to reduce network traffic when deploying updates, but keeping very hands off the update process. I might leave Mal to its default settings, or I might enforce its default settings to automatically check for updates, but I'd use a plist like this to make a configuration uh, profile that points to my internal Mal caching server. I could also write this out with a two-line script. That really is two lines. Now let's flip this around a bit. What if I still allow the user to, to determine when the updates get installed and continue to let Mal pull the updates from Microsoft, but I control the update version using my own manifest server, and I'd be hosting those, off, uh, those manifest collateral files on my own server? 
Here, I'm not worried about network bandwidth, not nearly as much as controlling the latest version that the user gets to install. That might be part of the change management process where new updates are vetted to uh, before they ever get released. So here's the plist I might make for that configuration profile. It's a little more complex than the other options so far. Of course, the script gets a little more complex too now. This workflow is very similar, except instead of letting the user decide when the updates are available, I, the administrator, set Mao to automatically download and install updates from Microsoft, but again, only those that I've approved on my caching, on my uh, manifest server. And this takes us one step further, uh, where I let my management tool of choice control the timing by scripting Mal to handle the updates. I'm still pulling the updates from Microsoft, but maintaining control over the version that's getting downloaded. In this case, the user says when, but I say from where and what version. Or I set Mal to keep Office to update automatically, and I say still from when and what version. Very uh, unobtrusive to the user. And finally, we get the most granular control possible. I let my management tool control when. I say from where, and I say what version. This is the same result as if I'd let my management tool say when, but I also use my own distribution and deployment tool. This last option, though, is completely Microsoft technology. This takes the most infrastructure set up because it involves something uh, to execute the update script, and it requires I have both a mal caching server along with a manifest server to host my collateral files. And I have to either push a configuration profile or a script to my client machines to disable Mao's automatic checking and point them to the right servers, my servers. I certainly didn't touch on every possible scenario here, but I hope I gave you enough information to pick a workflow or at least decide what you need to consider to pick a workflow. Review the matrix that I've shown you here when you need to plan how to manage your office updates. How important is enforcing updates? How important is network bandwidth to you? How important is it for you to control versioning? Do you have an existing management system that you want to utilize? If you choose the top three trigger, source, and version options, you'll have the least amount of work, but also the least amount of control. If you choose the bottom three trigger, source, and version options, you'll have to invest in your infrastructure but you'll have tight control over your office updates. More than likely, you're going to pick something in the middle. So with that, any questions? I've got one here. Yes? From the command line, how would you determine the version of Mal? So he's asking, from the command line, how would I determine the version of Mal? Uh, if you're using Mal 4, you can actually call that directly, and without applying any kind of parameters to the end of that, it will tell you right there. Now, if you're using anything before that, uh, do you have a management server at all, or do you have just command line capabilities to your devices? Let's say we just have command line capabilities. All right. Uh, Mao is an application. It's a .app file just like any other application. So if you need to, uh, go read the, uh, the Microsoft Auto Update .app folder, inside there is the contents file, and inside the contents file of any app is an info.plist. And typically the string, I think, is something like short bundle version string. So if you use a defaults right to read that short bundle version string of that info.plist, you should be able to get the version that way. Okay. All right, good question. Anyone else? We have 26 minutes to kill, folks. Yes, sir. Right. So the question that he asked was, uh, early on I showed that uh, we had registered apps. And the, uh, are these apps registered to 
Apple, in other words, the operating system, or are they registered to Mal? I think that's what you're asking, right? Okay. And the question is, they're registered to Mal. Uh, this has nothing to do with the launch services uh, database or anything like that. Mal has to know that the apps are installed before it can ever uh, provide updates for them. The only way that's kind of built in right now is for the app itself to register with Mal. And that means the app has to actually get launched and it will then register itself at that point. But with Mal 4.0, we'll have that command line tool finally, that, that process that lets us say, register these apps without having to have them launched first. That answer your question? Good. All right. Yeah, go for it. Oh, he's bringing the box. Yeah. I was bad. I didn't let you bring the box. I'm sorry. You did. You did repeat the question, though. That was good. <laughs> um, so, the you, you had said early on too about um, last year. Uh, the discussion was of when you're deploying apps, mm -hmm. um, don't use uh, like the, the, when 2016 first came out. Everyone was deploying the updates. Right. But there was licensing issues, and then when the licensing changed over, um, is still the best best practice deploy the full suite and then deploy updates, um, or is ah. that is that changed? Uh, so. Whenever we're deploying Office, is the best practice still to deploy uh, like the, the full installer and full then apply and the then, updates? And then do individual deltas or, or whatever from there. Or is, has, has there been a change where you can deploy the individual? Because um, it just had some, ah, some different stuff okay. to do with updating. And, and is Microsoft licensing um, apps individually, basically, is what you're asking, as opposed to a suite? I ish. If, 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 it, if it's... Uh, you know, some people don't use all the apps, and I could put it. I can make them available in self-service right. individually. Um, is that going to do anything? Mess with the licensing? Because I know early on with that early the, the switch early on where people were deploying um, the registration file instead of running the. Oh the yes, 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 yes. All right. So um, some of you might remember, and I'm kind of re paraphrasing the the question again. Some of you might remember last year that we were talking about. Uh, there's a volume licensing plist file that uh, gets put in only with the volume license installer. And uh, some folks had found that uh, it's easier just to pick up that file and put it on another machine in order to be able to license uh, devices. That worked great for 2011 and it also worked great for 2016. It might still work, but the problem is, and this is what Paul Bowden has been telling us, is that uh, that volume license installer is supposed to tie that plist file to the hard drive serial number, which means you, you're not supposed to be able to pick up that plist file and move it from machine to machine to machine in order to be able to license it. Yes? If it helps, I can Oh, grab let's grab the box real quick. Whoa. Sorry. There you go. If it helps, having recently replaced a hard drive on a machine, I can verify that you do need to rerun the serializer app they, afterwards. They got it fixed, huh? Well, That's good to know. Something else is broken, but All right. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, just to kind of uh, pick up on that, yes, uh, no. <laughs> we can no longer pick up that plist file and move it from uh, an installed machine to another machine to license. That means if you're deploying the volume license, you have to install, you have to run the installer. Now, Paul has been very good about giving us a second tool called the Volume License Serializer. This is only, again, available to Microsoft Volume License customers, but that tool can be run independently of a generic Office installer. Uh, the Office installer is, by all means, generic. It, matter, it has nothing to do with licensing, it has nothing to do with language version, all the languages are in it, but it's very generic. If you get the Microsoft Volume License Installer, it's going to include the, the Volume License Serializer inside it. Yay, you can just install it using whatever management tool you like. If you prefer, what you can do is keep that separate and uh, have the Volume License Serializer. You can deploy that before or after, it doesn't make a difference but you can always keep your Office installer up to date with the generic version. So that at any point, you can deploy the latest version of Office and keep it serialized uh, without having to do a lot of mucking around. 
Yes, sir. Uh, I forget the exact uh, syntax that you mentioned, but there's a last opened uh, command line option. Does, is, is that what you mentioned? Last open. I'm not sure what you mean. Oh, okay, maybe I'm thinking of a different. Um, is, is there a way to tell um, in the command line tool when Office was last used? Or do we still have to resort to uh, Spotlight metadata for that? Oh, interesting. So is there a way to determine when uh, any one of the individual apps was last used? That's, there's nothing built in that I'm aware of as far as the Office tools are concerned. I can tell you by looking at uh, the uh, uh, receipt when it got installed, but as far as keeping track of usage, I don't think so. Yes, sir. So I did a little exercise uh, looking at the various release dates of the previous versions of Office mm -hmm. and found out that there seems to be an average of 836 days in between releases with a standard deviation of 506 days. So it's pretty broad, but that brings up the obvious question. So when you, when you say releases, you're talking brand new versions. Brand new versions. All right. From version one to version two to version two. I did that a long time ago. I haven't done it lately. Um, and so that raises the obvious question. Is there, has there been any rumors or anything worth talking about with an Office 2018 or something like that? <laughs> So you're asking when's the next version of Office? That would have been perfect for Vivek. He would probably just turn like ghostly at that point going, I can't talk about that. But I, I, I always say use history as an indicator of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, if you consider that uh, Office 2008 came out around 2008, uh, followed by 2011, which came out around October of 2010, so just a couple of years later, and then you consider that uh, Office 2016 was roughly 15, 2015 it got released. So about five years later, yeah, it's all over the place. It's all over the place. Uh, I can almost guarantee though, well, I know what's going to happen. Paul Bowden has actually said this to us. Uh, as far as, if you're an Office 365 customer, you're going to get the latest update every single month going forward for as long as you're a customer. There's really not going to be a 2016 version of Office 365, but uh, what they're going to end up doing is as they rev, as they need to rev the product, especially for volume license or retail licensing, uh, they'll simply take what they've got at that moment and they'll call it whatever. It might be Office 2016, I mean 2018, might be Office 2019, but it'll effectively be the same version that Office 365 customers already have at that moment. So we're, we're pretty much getting away from the idea of major releases over a few years to very small incremental releases every month. Yes, sir. Uh, let's grab you the box. And to ex expand on that, uh, the version, the actual program is the same for 365 and for uh, retail and for li volume licensing customers. It's just the additional features are unlocked uh, for <laughs> 365. Right. So at a certain point, they'll probably shift some of those, I would imagine, to the retail or education or the volume licensing customers at a oh. certain point. I would imagine, I would, well, I would hope that we're not stuck on it. I hadn't thought about that. You're absolutely onto something there. So our, our folks that have had to go back and forth between volume license and uh, Office 365, are you aware that the Office 365 license gets you more features? And I think at this point it's well over 150, 200 additional features. Uh, I think one of those features, for example, like in uh, PowerPoint, if you want to export it to a particular type of file, like a movie file, I believe that requires the Office 365 license. There's no technical reason behind it. It's purely, purely sales and marketing. They really, really, really want you to go to Office 365. But you're raising an interesting point in that what happens when they do come up with this new revved version, Office 2019? Will they then start rolling in all those features that were available only to Office 365 into that new version? I don't know, but I think that's, that's a great idea. Uh, 
I, you know, I can give you my opinion. I think it's very unfair to the volume license folks because they are literally paying more for the software. The, uh, but you, you don't have the commitment of buying the software again, which is why they like giving it to Office 365 folks. And there's also, you, you would also have to take a look at the Office 10 model where they basically have said there will never be another Windows, there will just be a continual iteration of Windows 10. Right. Will we be seeing the same thing with Office, where there there will never be another in a version after uh, Office 16? We'll just be basically having an iteration. What does that mean for volume licensing customers? We don't know. Right. Uh, uh, Mikey, Mikey, Froger, Mike Lynn, however you like to to call him. He had a, a, a great uh, presentation at uh, Mac DevOps, and pretty much he was just saying the writing's on the wall, folks. And I think you can say this about Microsoft, too. With Apple, uh, they have gone so far as to say, uh, you know, we're going to uh, start requiring that users click OK before they run an application the first time, or we're going to throw up an alert that says this, uh, th this package or this uh, installer is not signed. And later they started taking away that privilege and now if a package or an app is not signed, you're going to get that alert and you just have to know how to work around it. And then going forward and forward, he's saying that Apple is really reducing uh, your, your privileges that you've been used to and they are driving you like cattle down a very specific path and eventually you can guarantee that is going to be the only thing you'll be able to do. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate saying that Microsoft is kind of going like that too. There may at some point never be a volume license version of Office. I don't know, I can't say. But uh, you know, then what do we do? Do we have uh, key log or key servers, something like that that we can run internally? I don't know, it, it can be a big mess. But I, th I think the writing's on the wall, and you've kind of hit on it. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, I'm currently not installed mouse on my uh, back my machines out there. Right. But, I, I, but I noticed with that caching server, could you take the down? Could you take the updates from that and mm -hmm. put them into a management system like yeah. Monkey? I figured and somebody would ask Auto that. Auto package is going to start looking at that too. Yeah, so pretty much what he's uh, pointing out is that uh, if you don't install Mal, it's not the end of the world. You don't have to install Mal. You can choose not to install Mal. But then what do you use to keep your, update, uh, keep your updates current? And that would be using your third-party server, your, your management server like Jamf or Monkey. And now he's kind of thinking, well, what if I take that Mal cache admin and I run it on my machine almost like Auto Packager? And I just kind of keep up with updates that way, and then I can download them automatically and throw them into my manifest or, or in, into my, my management server. Uh, you're probably going to make a, a few people at Microsoft cringe a little bit, and the only reason I say that is because uh, you have to know very specifically what version of update you need to apply to what person. And remember. Uh, Without getting any of the insider builds, you're getting at minimum three packages to install. So now you have to manage, uh, okay, for everybody who's three versions behind, you get the full installer. For everybody who's two versions behind, you get the larger delta. And then for everybody who's just one version behind, I just need to bring you right up to date, you get the smaller delta. Mal's going to take care of that for you. So if you've got that and you want to reduce the amount of work that you're doing, I would say Mal, but if you're a, a purist in a sense and you want to use your, your management server, that'll work. That will work. Yeah. So that's, that sort of gets back to um, what I was, uh, my first question about how deploying apps, because if you install the suite, you're getting Mal. And it's not on your grid, but my, uh, I've been on my to-do list for a while now is to find the best way to remove Mal so it never is popping up. I manage everything. Mm -hmm. Auto package runs you know, every three hours. Y you want it. a silent update experience for your users 
for pretty much everything, not just Office, but I'm assuming everything. Then, yeah, right? yeah. So, uh, and if not silent, everything's in self-service, or it's in in Monkey Managed Software Center. It's in that other yeah. tab. Um, I guess that's not really a question that's easily answered. But are there any side effects? Or Mal is independent of its of everything, so it's just would be deleting the app. The would that um, in the Office suite, if you went to help and hit with that update link, what would that? Does that just disappear? Or so when you say update, if you remove link. Mal, so oh, okay. in, in the office in office apps themselves, mm -hmm. there's a uh, update link. I think in oh. the help menu. So in other words, if you remove Mal, uh, what happens to that check for updates link in yeah, the just, application? Yeah, I want to make sure there was no adverse effects. Uh, if I, I've honestly never tried it to be honest, okay. uh, but uh, it, if it doesn't, gr it doesn't show up, okay. it doesn't show okay, up. Okay, that's that's. I think that's that makes been sense. the thing I've seen too. I just want to. I, I have some. Uh, uh, machines that have been deployed for a while that may still even have 2011 on them alongside of 2016, whether uh, the user never removed it um, or whatever. Right. But sometimes Mal is like, hey, I need admin credentials, or hey, it, uh, the uh, there's that prompt that it needs special... Uh, yeah, it would, it, yeah, Mal would pop up, it would be very intrusive, and yeah. especially if you're a standard user, used to be anyway, if you were, if you were a standard user, you couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, and yeah. it pops up every time, so... Um, yeah, I, I've been. It's like I said. It's been on my to-do list for a while just to remove it, um, and continue with auto package and, and manage software center to do that. I just I was, wasn't sure if there's any adverse effects. Or anything. No, absolutely not. Uh, we've actually had Paul Bowden say that uh, to us in the Slack channel. Okay. You, it, Mal is completely separate from the Office uh, suite. Yes, it gets installed as part of the Office installer, but it's uh, strictly there to help you keep updated. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. Use whatever tools you want. Awesome. Thank and you. Uh, there's no adverse effect to removing it, and your application simply will have to get updated a different way. So, definitely. All right. Anyone else? We got one over here. Hello? Oh. Is it on? Okay. Um, for, you had some plists for the updating and to make sure if it's automatic manual. Um, I've seen in a lot of cases where it's only via profile. So is there a particular place you have to put it to make sure no matter who logs in? Because I have mine joined to Active Directory so one okay. user can log in and you can set it, but it doesn't affect all the other users. Ah, so in other words, you're asking if uh, if I want to apply this up, up, apply the updates to specific users, but not others on the same machine. No, I'd like to apply this for all users. Oh, okay. Uh, and do you want to? Inf so you want to apply the, uh, the the mouse settings, whether it's checking for ma manually, automatically, or automatically downloading, installing. Uh, uh, are you saying that you don't have a, the ability to deploy a configuration profile and you want a different way? Oh, I can deploy it, okay. but I haven't been too successful at making sure that in a lab setting, mm -hmm. no matter who logs in, that box doesn't come up to say, do you want to manually oh, or do you want to? okay. You're having a problem with it uh, enforcing. Uh, what's your management system? I use Dell Case. Uh, using what? Dell Case. Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that, but... Uh, apply it computer-wide, not user level. Uh, and I'm, I'm giving you advice from Jamf because that's what I know. But uh, if, you, if you apply it computer level, you have to have the exact plist name without the dot plist. Uh, but that should be it. If you have the ability to create that configuration profile in Dell case and then download it immediately, uh, try that first before you even try to deploy it. Let's get the deployment part out of the way. And are you... When you do deploy it, do you actually see it show up in system preferences, in the profiles section? Uh, I haven't seen anything like that. I was doing the defaults right and okay. figure trying to do it that way via, via Apple remote desktop. Ah, gotcha. And, but that is per user right now, right now. I think with uh, Mal 4.0, that's going to actually get moved. That plist that you're trying to manage is going to get moved from the user space to the the admin top level library space, and that should work for you. 
but I, I've shown you two ways to, uh, to manage. If you can do it with, uh, by making that plist and then uploading it to a management server to create that configuration profile and you want to enforce it, do that. That's the best way of doing it. Oh, through the MCX to profile? Right, right. Only a configuration profile is going to give you that enforcement, that dimming of the options. If you write just to the script, uh, it's still wide open. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Anyone else? All right. So with that, uh, if you would, uh, please be sure to visit the feedback link and leave any kind words you can about this session. Uh, if you'd like to submit criticism or snide remarks, I'll ask you to post them to this feedback link instead. This is Patrick Ferguson's and Robert Hammond's <laughs> workshop from Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, they'll be glad to accept any negative comments you may have. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>